Good day, everyone, and welcome to Vanish Chicago Land Stories, the podcast. I am your host, Pete Castanis, and this is episode 19. And this program is brought to you by the opening of Nightbeat, which aired on WGN Channel 9 in the late hours with Jack Taylor with the late news. And here's the opening from 1980. Alrighty, we are back. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Nightbeat, I used to watch that uh, the news uh, almost every night when I was in college. And uh, when I was studying, um, I was at, I was enrolled at DeVry Institute. And I used to study uh, for exams and late at night. And then I needed to take a break. So right before I went to bed, I turned on night, Nightbeat. Uh, with Jack Taylor, sometimes hosted by Marty McNeely. So I will talk about Nightbeat in a future episode, and uh, hopefully I'll talk about Marty McNeely. He had a very interesting career on Channel 9 on WGN. Okay, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I will talk about a few things. Uh, uh, Last episode, I posted a commercial that featured Lee Phillip, and it was uh, about True Value Hardware Store. It was a Mother's Day commercial. So I'm going to talk about a little about her and her career. Let's see. Uh, her real name was uh, Lorelei June Phil- Phillip, and uh, she was married to William Bell, who created the, they both created the soap operas uh, Young and the Restless and Bold and the Beautiful, which are still on the air. And uh, let's see. So Lee Phillip, uh, her parents were florists, and she also had an older brother and a younger brother. And uh, she, I think she grew up in the, yeah, she grew up in Chicago, and uh, she graduated from Riverside Brookfield High School in Riverside, Illinois. And uh, she did, then she went to Northwestern University. After that, uh, when she graduated from college she uh, came and worked at her family's flower flower shop and then uh she started uh her brother mentioned uh to a about a television station and he arranged for her to be on television to on a talk show to demonstrate flower arrangement and then she uh took the job and so uh, she got hooked and, uh, you know, for being in the media. And then she quit uh, working at the flower shop altogether. So she started on TV in 1952. And it wasn't uh, WBBM, it was WBKB. And then uh, everything changed. Uh, I will talk that, about that in a future episode about the changing of the TV uh, call letters in Chicago. So, in uh, 19, December 50, 1952, she started her own show, and it was on fifteen. It was on. It was a fifteen-minute show, and it was on two fifteen in the afternoon every day. And then she would host uh, hosting five-minute segments. On it was called Homemaker News, and it was on every day around twelve twenty-five and around noontime. And then uh, the shows, uh, so the following year, 1953, she began hosting uh, shows, and they were named after her, like uh, Meet Miss Lee, Morning Miss Lee, Lee Phillips Chicago, Shopping with Miss Lee, and then all together, she got her own show with her own name, The Lee Phillips Show, and then it became Noon Break, and that was on at noon on WBM, WBBM TV Channel 2. Every day at 12 o'clock, uh, right 
opposite uh, Bozo Circus. And my mom used to watch the show. Uh, she used to watch Lee Filla because she thought she was darling and uh, a very nice lady. And she felt like she was your friend. And uh, so I, But we only had one television at the time when we lived in South Shore. And I would turn on Bozo and she would get a little miffed. So, But she let me watch, uh, you know, Bozo Circus. And I got hooked on that. And then when I went to school... Uh, you know, let's, let's say I went to school full time uh, after kindergarten. I went to first grade, and uh, then she started watching uh, during the day, and she watched it for years. And uh, she also did the weather, and she wore a special hat that uh, corresponded with the forecast, which was kind of I never saw that. Uh, that's what I, that's what I heard. And uh, she also read commercials and TV. And uh, she was there for a long, long time. And then she hosted a Saturday morning show for children. It was called The Friendship Show. And that lasted for 10 years. And she was also on the radio. And she had an afternoon. Uh, it was on every day on WBM, WBBM AM. And it was called The Lady and the Tiger. And uh the co-host was his name was Paul Gibson. Uh, I don't know anything about him. Anyway, uh, when she was on Noon Break, or the, or the Lee Phillips show, uh, uh, she never did. Uh, she rarely did controversial uh, topics. Not much, but uh, she did. But she interviewed a lot of people, a lot of famous people, politicians, uh, movie stars, television stars. I remember she interviewed. Uh, Two presidents, Jimmy Carter, Richard Nixon, uh, actors like John Wayne, Lucille Ball, Judy Garland. Uh, I remember Bert, I saw one with Burt Reynolds one time. I saw that. And that's when he was a very popular movie star in the 70s. And uh, so when the show went off the air, uh, probably in the early 80s, uh, her husband, William Bell, he was in advertising, and then he began writing for soap operas, uh, like, for example, The Guiding Light, As the World Turns, and Another World. And uh, all them, all those soap operas are gone now. And then when she left her own show, uh, she joined her husband, and they created The Young and the Restless, and that started in 1973. And The Bold and Beautiful started in 1987, and she was, she was, she's was been in California ever since. Uh, and uh, she never did um, – so she worked behind the scenes most of the time. And uh, she won a lot of awards, Emmy Awards, and uh, she's still in the Chicagoland area until the mid-'80s. And then uh, – her husband died in 2005, and uh, she had, uh, let's see, how many children? Three children. Her daughter, Laura Lee Bell, uh, was an actor. And she became an actress, and she acted on the soap operas. <clears throat> Excuse me, mostly on The Young and the Restless. I don't know if she's still on it. I don't think she is. And uh, she died. Uh, Lee Phillip died on February 25th, 25th 2020. And she was eight, 91. And, uh, you know, it's very sad because she was part of Chicago history. I wrote a story about her and my memories on my blog at vanishchicagoland.blog. So you can uh, go on, go into, uh, go into the blog and you can read it. And uh, what a lovely lady she was. Uh, she is still missed. You know, she was uh, part of the Chicago legends. Like, for example, uh, Bob Bell of Bozo. Cookie the Clown, which is Roy Brown, Ray Rayner, Frazier Thomas. She was part of that. So what a it's uh, what a career she had. Okay. Now let's talk about something else. Uh, right now I'm going to talk about Bonanza Steakhouse. Now, uh, from what I understand, Bonanza Steakhouse, they, I think they named it after the television show. Uh that ran on NBC from 1959 to 1973. And, uh, you know, it starred Lauren Green, uh, Dan Blocker, Michael Landon, and Pernell Roberts. And he left the show in 1965. 
And uh, Bonanza Steakhouse, I think it started late 60s, but not in Chicago. I Probably California. And then it just took off uh, other cities. Uh, I came to the Chicagoland area, I think about the mid-70s. Uh, the first time, <clears throat> excuse me, the first time I saw it was, <clears throat> excuse me about that. The first time I saw Bonanza Steakhouse was in the mid-70s when I lived in the Ashburn area. And there was one located uh, about 82nd Street and Cicero in Burbank, Illinois. And the first time we, uh, I went there, I went with my family and there was another family with us. And we went there for lunch after church on Sunday. And uh, the family introduced us. And uh, so I remember we walked in and we grabbed a tray and uh, we placed our order and they gave us a, uh, I forgot what that's called, like your number. So you put it on your tray. And uh, so I remember, and usually the, uh, they ask you what type, uh, what kind of, how would you like your steak? How would you like it preferred? You know, medium rare, rare, well done. I remember that. And I remember it had, say, rare, let's say medium uh, well, number seven, number eight, something like that. And you would get a baked potato and uh, some uh, either garlic bread or butter toast, which was crunchy. It was very good, you know, and the steaks were very good. They were very good. We ate there about uh, several times, and uh, there were other locations. I don't know. Uh, I know one on the north side that was uh, in Skokie, but uh, I found a picture in, a, in the Chicago Tribune, and they showed the locations with plus the photos, and there was one in Countryside, Midlothian, uh, Darien, in Dalton, and one in Worth on 111th Street, uh, west of Oak Park Avenue. So the one in Burbank, I'm, uh, the building is still there, and now it's called Matson's. And uh, the business is still there. I have never eaten there in Matson's. I don't know why. Uh, never, I don't know. Kind of. I, maybe I still miss Bonanza. And... Uh, so they left it for the Chicago land area in the 80s. I think they were still around after that. I could be wrong. Maybe they all closed at the same time. And I maybe some of them have converted into Ponderosa. I've been to Ponderosa, and that opened uh, almost immediately after Bonanza. So Ponderosa was named after the house where the Cartwrights lived on Bonanza. And... Uh, but Ponderosa lasted a lot longer than Bonanza. It was still the same to me. Uh, like I said before, I never, yeah, I did eat there, but I was trying to compare the both of them, and it's almost the same. You know, there's there's a couple, of, uh, there's a few similarities. Uh, they had probably the same menu. And the last time I went to Ponderosa was about oof, maybe 20 years ago. It was in Bridgeview, and uh, they closed. Uh, Probably the early 90s. I'm not sure. So uh, when I post something about Bonanza restaurants, people remembered. And uh, most were most had memories fondly about that place. They loved it. Uh, steakhouses are still around. You have Outback. Uh, I can't think of other ones. Uh, they have fancy ones downtown. I think one is called Cut Rate. I haven't been there. So uh, I still love to go to a steakhouse. It's a, it's a smell and the ambiance and the amp the atmosphere of it. It's still a good place to eat. Okay. Another thing I will talk about is the Union Bank of Roseland, and that was located at. Uh, I'll look it up for you. Okay, that was located at a hundred eleventh. 06 South Michigan Avenue, uh, right near where I used to live in the Roseland area. Now, that bank was very uh, special. Uh, when we moved to Rose, my family, when my family moved to Roseland, we did. Uh, my my father had accounts there. It was uh, previously we lived in South Shore, and he had it at the South Shore Bank on 71st Street and Jeffrey Boulevard. And uh, later on, it turned into Shoreland, and then uh, it closed. So uh, 
What's a shame? It was right next to the Jeffrey Theater, and that closed as well. So, last I heard, they're gonna the building's still there. The building's still there. Hopefully, they'll do something with it. Uh, they should because uh, Jeffrey Theater is gorgeous. Uh, I never went to the theater, but I saw photos of it, and people from the area that used to live there they said it was a a gorgeous theater, and the lobby was very stunning. Anyway, back to uh, Union National Bank. Uh, I don't know when it opened, probably about eh, maybe 40s or 50s. Uh, what's interesting about this bank in, I think, around 1962 and 1963, they started having automatic tellers. Or, no, I'm sorry, it's like a drive through bank. And drive through banks uh, have been around since the 60s, but this one in particular had an automatic teller vision. That means that you would drive up to, I don't know if it was an ATM, but I think it was like a, like a, a slot where you put your bank book or your deposit slips or your withdrawal slips. And then all of, and there was a TV screen and you would talk to the teller and you would see her. It was something like out of the Jetsons. (laughs) So maybe they got that idea. And, uh, when we lived there, I don't think it was there anymore. Um, I think the drive through was still there, but uh, I remember going inside the bank. It was a beautiful building. Uh, luckily, this, the building is still there, but it's not a bank anymore. So, um, But they built another bank, and I think it's – I don't know what it's called anymore. I can look it up uh, as I'm talking. And uh, so – so the bank was, uh, we lived in Rosa for about, uh, oh, here it is. The bank is called Seaway. So it was Seaway Bank. I think there was one on, <coughs> excuse me, at um, 87th Street east of Dan Ryan. I don't know if it's still there. So um, so I, I think, um, you know, when we moved out of the neighborhood in 1974, I think it was still there. Uh, it probably closed in the late 70s, so that's a shame. So it was very innovative at the time, you know, when you saw a teller on the screen and then you would, you know, she talked through a microphone. I saw, I had a picture somewhere on my files, and uh, it was uh, like pre um, Zoom, <laughs> like we have now, <laughs> or like a FaceTime, you know, on Apple. So that was uh, very interesting. Anyway, okay, and uh, the next thing I want to talk about is is the uh, Ant- Antoinette Pope School of Cooking, and I'll, I'll read you a little history about that. And uh, Ant- Antoinette, Antoinette Pope and her husband Francois uh, they opened a cooking school. And it was called the Ant- Antoinette Pope School of Fancy Cook- uh, Cookery. <clears throat> Excuse me. They opened in their basement on the South Side in 1930, and the school closed in 1971. And uh, Antoinette was born in Italy, and Francois, of course, was a native of France. Uh, I don't know if he uh, was born in Chicago or he was born in France. I don't know. And she, uh, Francois worked with his parents at a Parisian cafe, and she learned how to cook from there. And uh, they started the school, and uh, according to her son, their first class was a group of 10 in her dining room, and then it got so popular, and uh, so they decided, why don't we just uh, you know, open a school? So uh, I don't know where their first house was, but then later on they moved to a bigger home on 77th Street and Marshfield, right, a block, uh, let's see, yeah, about a half a block west of Ashland. And uh, so they uh, started a cooking school there, and then uh, then they uh, put all these recipes together and in, in numerous cookbooks, and the first, the Antoinette Pope School cookbook was first published in 1948. And it was it was been revised many times, many times, and they were sold uh, at bookstores like uh, Croc and Bertano's, and uh, I can't think of others. Maybe B. Dalton, probably. Uh, 
and Marshall Fields, you know, most of the department stores, you know, uh, Marshall Fields, Carson, Carson Perry Scott, uh, Wee Bolts, of course. And then, uh, then uh, the last edition of the book came out in 1973. So in 1942, they opened a cooking. They opened a cooking school, and it was located at 316 North Michigan Avenue. And it had about you could. It was like an auditorium, and it held 150 students there. So uh, then they had their own TV show that started in 1951. I think it was on Channel Seven, I believe, which was uh, WNER at the time. Then it moved to, then it changed to WBKB, and it was called the Creative Cooking Television Show, and it showed uh, Francois Pope and his sons Frank and Robert, and it was there until 1963, and it was on every day, which we like have, which we have cooking shows now, all over the television, you know, on cable. We have the Cooking Channel, we have the Food Channel. Uh, we have Rachel Ray. She does it every day. So that was the first one that aired, uh, the creative cooking television show, uh, first time. That, and, uh, so, uh, now the school closed in 73 and then, uh, so the, her son still, uh, cook in various restaurants. So, and uh, you could still find the cookbooks on eBay or Amazon. And uh, when I post about the, because that, this is the first time I've heard of this place uh, about a couple of years ago. And it, when I did that on my Facebook page on Vanish Chicagoland, uh, people remembered it fondly. They remember enrolled in the school. They remember buying the books at the time and they tried all the recipes. I can't think of one that's very popular, but they were from what I told, uh, they were delicious, and I heard the desserts were out of this world. So that's very interesting. You know, I, I like to learn more about the about the school and with Antoinette and uh, Francois. Okay, so that'll be all for today. I'm glad you enjoyed uh, the show. Um, you can join me. You know, hopefully, you can join me next, on my next episode, uh, probably this weekend. And uh, so this is Pete Castanis of the host of Van Chicago Land Stories, the podcast, episode 19. And I, I hope everyone will have a good day and, and bye-bye for now. And take it away, Ray Rayner. We have to go. Bye-bye-bye. <laughs>